Okay, thank you guys for being here. I'm so excited. This is the wild panel for the Outfronts. Um, and we have an amazing uh, cast of characters here. We have Amy B. Harris, Sarah Stryker, Irana James, and Mia Healy. Um, I am really, really excited because I am a big fan of the Wilds, uh, not only just for the gay, which is always an added bonus, um, but I love just like, you know, anything YA that's super queer, super, you know, girl fronted. I'm just, I'm stoked to be here talking to you guys. Um, thank you for doing this. I figured because this is Outfest or the Outfronts that we would just start it off in the queerest way possible. And I can ask you guys what your star signs are. Let's just get that out there. Um, Sarah, why don't we start with you? <laughs> Um, sure. I am um, what is I'm a Capricorn and I have been told I'm quite a classic Capricorn in the sense that I'm um, driven, controlling um, ah. <laughs> I um, and, and quite self-conscious about um, about um, my own competency, competency about this, that and the other. So love that. Love to be unsure, <laughs> although you have no reason to be. Um, Amy, how about you? I am a Pisces with a Cancer rising. Wow. And my astrologer told me if I didn't have Aries in my 10th house, I would most likely be a drug addict. Uh, so, it's a lot of water. It's very loosey goosey and lost. But I guess Aries is career and ambition. So uh, in the 10th house. So it's it, that's the one that that keeps me going, I guess. That's Great. A, a, a narrow miss. A lucky one. Um, yes. A lucky miss for me. <laughs> <laughs> Mia and Arana, how about you? Um, I'm a Virgo, which I always thought that I wasn't a Virgo. I, I just never really related to it. And as I get older, I see myself becoming more and more Virgo, like quite pragmatic um, and I guess organized. Not in my like bedroom, but in my like life. Yeah. I feel like I'm quite organized. <laughs> I am an Aquarius sun, which I think is quite true, even though to my detriment sometimes. Um, and a Pisces moon and a Gemini rising. Wow. Thank you for the full chart. I, <laughs> I love that we all know our full charts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can bring it down there, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. I feel, I feel safe now. I'm comfortable and settled in. <laughs> uh, so I want to I wanna start off by talking for real this time um, about just, you know, the world of the show and the creation process behind it. Um, Sarah, you created the show. What was your creative process in making all of these characters, especially in regards to Tony and Shelby? Are there real people in your life that inspired them or queer stories that inspired you? Um, yeah, I uh, the character generation process is almost difficult to talk about very coherently, which is not a great answer from a writer who is purportedly should be able to kind of talk about the the how the sausage is made um but i think it's there's something a little bit <clears throat> you know once i had this premise and once that i knew that i wanted to put you know eight young women on this deserted island um i definitely thought about the ensemble i started with Leah, because she is a bit of a surrogate for myself, a very overthinking writerly type um, who had just been through a breakup. It was that was the autobiographical way in. But then once I had the notion that, OK, well, I'm going to have this ensemble around them. I want all of these young women to be, you know, relatable, but also very distinct. And you have to kind of a little bit create a um, symphony when you are creating an ensemble. People have to hit high notes, low notes, um, people who are action driven, who can, you know, push things forward, people who are more reluctant, that will create the conflict, um, people who are more emotional, less emotional, um, so that you have just the enough grist in the mill to make the conflicts really pop. Um, so when I sat down to actually generate the characters, it was a lot of mining into the young women that I have known in my in my life. Um, that is sort of where I started. Again, it is it is hard to talk about because there's almost like an alchemical thing, I think, that happens when you 
are a writer alone trying to build this group, you kind of wait for voices to come to you. That sounds very, you know, kind of woo-woo. And I, I, I generally don't love to come off that way, but I really just sort of waited to hear and feel the inspiration um, from individuals as they bubbled up. Um, and one person who came to me was um, a, a young woman that I'd known in junior high. She was an athlete and she had, she had a very, a very kind of um, hair trigger temper. Um, and that was the inspiration for Tony. Um, and I mean, this was a girl that I admired so deeply um, because I was this very closed off Midwestern child who never wanted to do anything wrong. And here was this girl who was so able to tap into that animal, like I'm angry and I'm gonna show it. Um, and so I have, a, I have a lot of admiration for that. Um, and so Tony was really crafted from, from that place. Um, uh, and then, you know, Shelby certainly came into the fold um, as a little bit drawn from a, a few of the more, I guess, faith driven um, uh, young women that I'd known in my high school years also, who, you know, also had, they had this incredible faith. Um, and uh, that also was something that I admired. Every single one of these characters embodies a quality that I really kind of coveted um, to have a faith that supports you, carries you, feeds you um, is something that that I really didn't have. I, I grew up very irreligious. In terms of their sexuality, um, I had always intuited, again, in an alchemical sort of just, this is what I, I, I felt that, that Shelby was someone who was carrying this, um, sh she, she was gay and she was trying to figure it out amidst the swirl and haze of this faith, um, a very fundamentalist faith that, you know, made it difficult for her to, to express that. Um, uh, as for Tony, um, I will be quite transparent in that <laughs> this Tony being a lesbian was something that I felt initially, but did not exactly lock in. Um, we had this huge ensemble and, you know, Leah was such a big part of the pilot that, uh, you know, there was a lot of meditation on her character. Um, but for the others, it was like, okay, I'm going to flesh them out this much, but there are some things that I felt almost reluctant to really lock lock in. And Tony's sexuality, you know, was one of them. I wanted to create this inclusive ensemble with um, with many different young women um, from many different backgrounds of many different racial, socioeconomic origins. Um, and, you know, when it came to Tony, for example, um, you know, she is an indigenous character. She is uh, from Minnesota. She is um, a, a, an orphan uh, of sorts, um, a, a child of the foster system. That's so many layers of things that, that I personally am not um, that, you know, when it came to really thinking about her sexuality, I was like, okay, I'm going to be very careful about this. I'm going to maybe not lock it in, in the most, um, in the most certain way. And I will wait until the writer's room. That's really the beauty of a writer's room, I think, which is why I love television much more than I enjoy writing for film which is you get to kind of build out this beautiful room of voices that then give voice to your characters. And for, I think for both for me, obviously I came in after the pilot, um, but for me and for Sarah, it was such a thrilling thing to be able to have these new voices in the room with very different perspectives, came from very different places. Um, and Tanya Kong, who was one of our writers, um, you know, an athlete uh, identifies as queer, um, 
Asian, uh, you know, so it's like we had this, we suddenly had like all these new beautiful voices in the room who could really speak to uh, places that Sarah and I didn't necessarily always feel like we were coming from a place of power in. Um, I like to think as a writer, you can really write all sorts of characters. You do your research, you speak from the heart, you're authentic, but to have these amazing uh, other voices that can speak from experience obviously is a huge piece of the puzzle. And I think what was so exciting for us when we started talking about Tony is we had one character who was struggling with their sexuality. And then we got to tell another story about a character who that was just simply a part of her identity. The things she was actually struggling with were her anger, her sense of abandonment because she didn't have, you know, a strong familial uh, grouping to be a part of. So for us, that's when it got really exciting. Um, and then to realize like, oh, the yin and yang of these two characters coming together will be really beautiful for both of them because it will hopefully allow Shelby to become herself um, and become authentic and would allow Tony um, to take a breath and have less fear. Now, of course, the journey in that is the uh, exciting experience. You don't get to just have one one event and then be calm in yourself. If that was the case, I'd feel a lot better in the last 30 years. Um, you know, you're constantly growing and evolving. So that's the, that's the joy of it, I think, is um, uh, and the excitement. And I think in what people I think are tapping into is that we're showing a lot of different experiences and hopefully they feel really authentic to people. Yeah. And, and I think they do. And, and, you know, I think that I do think that like something that a lot of people, especially young women relate to about this show is that it shows the span of um, queer experience um, and has a diversity of, it, of experience in so many different you know places outside of the LGBTQ um, community. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, well, Amy, something I wanted to ask you was, you know, you've been producing television for teens and young women for so long from, you know, Gossip Girl to The Carrie Diaries. I mean that in the, the most utmost respect way. Oh, <laughs> I 100% I, uh, I like, embrace my experiences. They are, you know, <laughs> deeply proud of them. So it's been a long time and I'm grateful for it. You should be. I, I, I identify as being raised on Gossip Girl. Um, so, thank you. Um, but you know, what I Good wanted pleasure. to <laughs> what I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, um, what do you think makes the wilds so relatable to and current um, to young women and teen girls today? Like, why why is this the show that so many young girls have latched onto in the same way that they have for your shows in the past? I, you know, it's interesting because they're obviously very, Sex in the City, Gossip Girl, Carrie Diaries. The wild they're all very different in terms of tone energy but i think actually what they all sort of have in common is um even gossip girl which is so heightened in its um the world it portrays the people in it are very authentically a part of the worlds that they're in and i think um what sarah did so beautifully in the pilot in creating these characters is you see yourself in these people. So even if you're not Blair Waldorf living in a penthouse, you have parents who have ignored you and to, <laughs> who haven't seen you for like the inside parts of you. So you become cold and bitchy and scary, or you become broken and addicted. Um, and I think like what the wilds has done that I loved about Sex and the City is we used to say like, Sex and the City is about being naked and not literally. It was like we were really exposing emotions, I think, in a way that people had not seen in women before. Like we were they were raw. They were authentically themselves, even if it wasn't always appealing. Um, and I think I, it's hard for me in the moment of being in an experience of a show to totally understand why it's hitting such a great mark. But I do think like the raw authenticity of characters allows you to care for them because you see yourself in them or you feel you know them and then you invest. I mean, twists and turns are great and are always a fun part of a show, but at the end of the day, we're telling a character driven show and you have to fall in love with these characters. And I think the writing is doing that, but I also obviously think this cast is allowing people to just latch on in this unbelievable 
way. They just, they look at Shelby and Tony, they look at Leah or Dot, they feel, they see themselves in them, even if they're not, it's not an exact replica of them. It's like, there's an essence that they feel seen. And I think that's what makes shows work for people. Totally. And, and I want to talk about the fan base. I think it's no secret that the Wilds has a very um, fervent fan base. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, you know, Tony and Shelby, just from what I've seen online, have one of the biggest like ship fandoms these days. Uh, so I wanted to ask Mia and Irana, is there any is there any on screen couple that you have felt this way about in the past? Like, who is your who are your favorite ships of the past of the past? Or current. We were kind of having I mean, a conversation. We were, about this the day. <laughs> we were kind of having a conversation earlier about um, Fleabag and the, the sexy, sexy priest. priest. That's a yeah. That's a big one. I feel like <laughs> yeah, definitely. They're great. Yeah, um, I don't know. I kind of like anytime for me. It's like anytime I see a relationship on screen that I believe, like I'm invested. Do you know what I mean? Like no matter. If, what it is like as if it's working and I'm hooked then I'm hooked and I'm, I'm standing those people. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the best or funniest things that your fans have said to you guys? They step say, on my neck, step, step on my neck, bestie. <laughs> they say, punch me in the face, bestie. I'll thank you. <laughs> yeah. You can run me over the car. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Brutal. <laughs> so brutal, brutal. Really brutal stuff. What do they say? <laughs> There's been some tattoos. Yes. Um, Someone got shot. All tattooed on them. Did you hear yes, about this? <laughs> Someone got yeah. shell tattooed on um the name and also the face. They got like the yeah. little bit of shell balled. So I was this is only funny because one of the things Sarah had hoped for when we would be in the writer's room that there would be some fan art along the way. And I'm so superstitious and nervous. And I was like, or Sarah, like, there's not going to be any fan art. Like, maybe it'll be like one person, and then we'll just be. And now it's like they're also doing fan art of us. I was like, if you told me, like, I just was so ready to be like hiding under a table and feeling like they're not one. And then there's a tattoo of shell yeah. belt. I mean, well, Sarah, they have, um, they have the line controls a fucking fantasy down to like the front of somebody's arm. Like, there's 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 a lot, a lot of tattoos. Um, which wow. Is, very cool. Yeah, a lot of a lot of a lot of aggression. They want us to um yeah, punch them in the face, step on their yeah. throats. Yeah. Sort of someone um, <laughs> you'll someone get that, yeah. Wanted us wanted me to write out a line for them to get tattooed on them. And I was like, I messaged them back because they were it, it, reaching me from from Instagram and Twitter and all these different platforms and got hold of them and I responded to them and I was like, I don't I was like trying to write it out and I was getting so nervous with my handwriting. I was like, this is so much pressure. Like, <laughs> and they're like, no, it's great. This is perfect. I'm like, I was so stressed, but <laughs> hopefully it looks good. <laughs> that is so funny. And I I mean, just so you guys know, and it is the highest honor of the lesbian community to be asked to be punched in the face or run over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gathering that. I'm gathering yes. that. <laughs> if, if you're getting asked those questions or those demands, you're doing something right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mia, uh, Mia and Irana, this is for both of you guys. You guys have such you know palpable chemistry on screen. Will you talk a little bit about how you first met and how you guys came to find that together? So we first met on my birthday, on my birthday um, when we were doing the pilot, we were waiting in the production office and you came in and chatting. Our eyes met. <laughs> no, we, we started chatting in the office and then went and got dinner and hung out. And then it, it literally was like just the rest was history. We just kind of had an instant connection. And then straight after the pilot, we went and lived in LA together. Like for, five days after we flew out of the pilot, I went, back to Wellington, packed two suitcases and flew to LA yeah. to see me out. So <laughs> it was just like, we just had the best time. We just became like so close instantly. And um, I guess we've just always had that mm. chemistry was already there. And I think because um, we know each other like inside and out, it kind of allows us when we're acting together and we're playing these characters to kind of. It's just a lot of trust between us. And so, yeah. when, you know, when we get to, play Tony and Shelby and they are finding their trust together. It's so amazing for us because that's already yeah. there between we us. We get to spend that time time um, as the characters, purely being the characters. We don't have to really worry about like- Connection. The connection between us because it's just there. So it, it does a lot of the work day on set, we were 
were on set and I was like, Oh God, like I, I like, I need to be working a bit harder. Like I don't, like I need to. And then yes. it was like, well, the hard work would be in having to try to connect with somebody that I'm not already connected with. But mm. since we were already so disconnected, it was like, that just makes the job so much easier. We were doing the scene where we were, can we sign up? Oh. <laughs> we were doing the same where we were just hanging out. and then I remember walking, walking away being like, ah, oh, it just feels too, too easy. Remember? Yeah, like, it's, yeah, just yeah. So, it's just happening too easy. And then we're like, wait a second. That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Tell me about Amy, Sarah, Amy, Sarah. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> how, how do each of you feel like you are similar to your character and what, and what do you like about them? <clears throat> similar to Tony um I think me you can probably just quite I think I'm quite outspoken I think I feel things very strongly mm-hmm. and everyone is very aware of what I'm feeling at each moment and maybe not as maybe not as aggressive as as um as Tony but you know if I'm sad I'm can tell I'm feeling fucking sad or you know what I mean like mm-hmm. those things are very at the surface in the same way that Tony's is and something that I which is something she sounds kind of arrogant now, but that's something that I admire in Tony, you know, like her, how strongly she knows herself and her unapologetic nature to just, um, just, yeah, act off her impulses and just be who she is and just and throw herself at people. And if they catch it, they do. And if they don't, then fuck it. Like it's that energy in her is, yeah, one of my favorite, favorite things. I feel like Shelby and I are similar in the sense that we're both quite gregarious and quite positive um, people. Um, I think we're similar also in the way that we, we both kind of like, not like you, like I kind of will put my feelings aside to push something, another agenda, I guess, or kind of, um, it's easier for me to kind of shut off to, to get something done, to do a job, to, to achieve something. Um, and Shelby definitely, definitely does that. She can bury and bury and bury until like the guilt that comes in and like, then it just explodes I also think we carry guilt kind of similarly not as um I mean the, what Shelby does with her guilt can be quite quite awful but um I definitely understand and relate to Shelby and like that feeling that, like, that fear of guilt almost and that the way she carries that on her shoulders I, I I relate to um I just love how I love how positive she is I love how she's just constantly trying like even though it's kind of like you know, not always the best thing for her, but she's just constantly trying to be a, a good, a good person. You know, she's got good intentions like 24 seven. And that's something that I really, really admire about her. Yeah. I, I wanted to know, was there anything that you guys did to prepare for these roles in like the physical sense, whether that is like watching survivor doing mad push ups, anything like that? <laughs> um, I feel like, yeah. I, I watched a lot of Friday Night Lights, which Sarah got me onto in the pilot. She, you came into my trailer with the iPad and was like, watch this for, for the accent, just that sort of Texan, Texan culture, I guess. Um, so I watched a lot of that. Tried to watch as many like pageant things mm. as possible, like just YouTubing, because that, that's something that was so foreign to me, the whole pageant world. So that was something I really had to like dive into, but also very fun research to be doing. To, mm. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I was going to say like the, when you say like preparing for like the physical space of it all, it's, um, you know, it's not like we're doing studio work where you step out and it's like beautiful sunny LA and then you, you know, and it's, you are, the physical happens for you. Do you know what I mean? Like you're in these environments and they're like tearing you down and throwing you around. And so the push ups, like, you know, like that kind of thing, it just isn't necessary because if you're sprinting in and out of like waist deep water, like your heart's pumping, like your adrenaline's going, your legs are moving. Like the environment helped us um, prepare really. Yeah. You know? it was, she was yeah. Our and Sarah and Amy, was there anything like that you guys did that was funny world building research that you had to do to, you know, get the authenticity of being stranded on, a, on an island? Um, well, the whole writers' room watched that show alone. Um, it's that I love alone. Oh, obsessed! <laughs> <laughs> so good. It's like, it's like the Cadillac and Survivor shows. It's you know because you're the the people are uh, 
alone, um, mm-hmm. the economist title. Uh, and so you're reliant on your own resources. And what was so telling when we were watching that is, you know, the people who were comfortable being with themselves, um, you know, rather than social situations or people who had this immense, immensely rich inner life were often the ones who were, you know, quite that went the distance. Um, and I think uh, it was just encouraging for, for us in the writer's room to, to really lean into that. As, because, you know, when it comes down to it, all of these characters ha- really do have rich inner lives and a lot of resources that maybe they didn't even know about before they were on this island. But as they're there and they're discovering things, they're discovering the depth of their resilience um, that then it really shows and they, you know, are outperforming, I think what they would have even expected for themselves. Um, so that was definitely a big, um, uh, informative source. Just even that when like the amount of shit that falls, like comes up from the water, like the kinds of fun ideas that it inspired, like, Oh, they can make nets for fishing or last awful plastic comes up in the water. Like, all these different ideas that kind of inspired other ideas for us in the room was really alone for me was one of those things like the the people who had the most work to do on themselves kind of collapsed a bit and that to us is a little bit like what is happening for us on this show it's like they're surviving physically and actually that sense of resilience and understanding because they're not alone they're in a group of eight girls is allowing them to also sort of start dealing with the, the, I mean, this is Sarah's whole premise for the show is it's a, it's a metaphor for adolescence. Like how do you survive these enormous um, life and death stakes of coming of age and they're doing it. They're having to prove to themselves physically they can survive it. And then the eight of them, I think in many ways are helping with the inner with the figuring out their the inner emotional survival, which I think is a big uh, part of the show. Yeah, and you know something I found really interesting about um, Shelby is, you know, I mean, all of the girls experience this, I think, in their own way. But just relating to it personally from the queer side of things, um, you know, it kind of takes being totally freed from her like homophobic household and upbringing to be able to, you know, experience anything and move forward. And um, I mean, I was lucky to not be raised in, in a household like that, but I think most queer people can relate to the experience of, you know, whether it's just like moving to LA or New York or like just a city where there are other queer people and then getting to open up a little bit more and, you know, be around your people is so, important. Um, and I, and, you know, speaking to what we were talking about before with the range of queer experience on the show, um, you know, I think there's kind of this assumption these days that Gen Z is so past everything with, you know, sexuality and gender, um, when it's just not true for so much, you know, speaking to America, the whole, the whole middle of us are still experiencing a lot of that stuff. Uh, so I wanted to talk to, you, Mia, about um, this, you know, would you say in your experience from what you've seen in your own, own life, you know, it, do you, what do you think about, is our culture generally pretty accepting of queer people these days? Or, um, you know, can you see how both stories really play out in real life? Um, I think I was raised in a family with parents who were very heavily involved in the queer community and very, um, yeah, very, involved in that community and it was interesting for me growing up and reaching towards the end of high school and kind of or like early high school and realizing that people were like using homophobic slurs and I didn't really understand what it even meant because it's just not the kind of the the home that I'd come from and the environment that I'd been brought up in um and I think yeah uh, becoming an adult and realizing um what queer people really go through all the time and the history that's there um, doesn't just go away overnight. And it's not something that, um, yeah, that, that people can just sort of like accept one day and everyone's just like, like going to be um, legends about it. Like there are still some people out there that are like not. So I think what's really good is like 
shows like this, you know, showing queer people and having that be accessible to people across the world to like go on Amazon and watch or like any other show that tells queer stories and watch these, watch these characters just be completely themselves and be human. Um, and it's a shame. It's a shame that um, people have to kind of like what you were saying earlier, like kind of free themselves from the shackles of their, of their upbringing or their home in order to, in order to be free in themselves. But I guess it's kind of true. Like sometimes you have to lose yourself in order to find yourself. And I think that's a huge thing in, in the queer community. I think that's a big part of the culture. Um, but yeah, I don't think, I don't think it's gone away at all for sure. Yeah. And Irana, you play a queer indigenous character, an identity that we almost never see represented on TV. If ever, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, what was that like for you and, and how did you bring your own experience to the role? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing being able to play indigenous character. Like when obviously being indigenous and coming into this industry, you hope that there's people that are going to write stories that you're able to tell, that there's going to be a, you know, a space for, for your voice here. And so then having Sarah and Amy write this character that is indigenous and, you know, I'm Maori. And so then there's also this other side, since I'm from New Zealand, it's like, and you're trying to come into an American industry. And, you know, I'm aware that my the truest experience that I can tell is one of being an indigenous Maori person. And so being able to just play an indigenous person period without having to be specific on where that person is from, but just speak from the, from that experience is like, it's amazing. It opens up the opportunity of storytelling for me and also opens up the opportunity for people to see themselves in that character, regardless of, you know, just being indigenous anywhere. And then going back to what I was saying before about like one of my favorite things about Tony, about how fiercely she knows herself and that being wrapped up in her queer identity is, it's just so powerful. And, um, yeah, doubling her queer and her Indigenous identity and how it's something that she's just is so fiercely strong in. Um, I, I admire her a lot for it, I think. Yeah, no, and both of your characters are so great on, you know, the opposite sides of the spectrum in some ways, and it's they're both great to see. On Okay, on a much lighter note, uh, Mia, you are on TikTok, like <laughs> so many of us in the past year. I just want to know like what corners of TikTok you're on because my algorithm went straight to lesbian TikTok. I'm on like baby TikTok and sword TikTok. Like what is your for you page? <laughs> it, it changes. When I first got TikTok, I def it definitely went straight to lesbian TikTok and I had no, and this is a, I didn't know much about TikTok and I was just like, fuck, this app is Wait. sick. You know what I mean? And then <laughs> it changed. And then it, 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 yeah, it went to like food. We were talking yeah. about baby TikTok the other day. Um, gender reveals. I don't know yeah. why that was like, I don't know how this, I don't know how it works, but um, it's constantly changing. Um, but I always, there's always dogs. I'm always on dog TikTok. That's always been a. <laughs> Is anyone else here on TikTok? I mean, like, like I have a TikTok, like I do, and I, I when when the show started coming, when the show started coming out, people started following me. I was like, I changed my Jeez. name to like Blonde Bed at sixty nine or something ridiculous. Mm. I don't know, but well, now everyone knows. <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know how they found it. I don't know how, it. It. but I am on TikTok. But I. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of social media to keep up with. So I'm like kind of cleansing myself of a few at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I've like let go of Twitter. I'm in the process of letting go of TikTok. Like I'm just trying to, but TikTok is one that I miss and I think about often, which probably is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so fun. Also, I saw Amy, your hand went up. You're on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I am on TikTok. I have a daughter, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not, I have a daughter, so I'm trying to kind of figure out what she's into and there's a lot of uh stranger things edits and she's interested in all the wild edits so we watch those together um and she's very into makeup transformations not the sort of beautiful ones but the scary uh with latex and blood so that that's become a big part of my uh tiktok life <laughs> and dogs <laughs> dogs are always going to be a part of my tiktok life and that 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 would definitely be the lead on my on my FYP page for sure. Somebody <laughs> sent me a TikTok the other day that was like a makeup change that somebody like painted their face so much that they looked identical to Kate Blanchett. 
and it wasn't yeah. even like I was like I don't even find this cool this is like scary <laughs> like, yeah no it's a it's it, the makeup ones for me are truly incredible because it's like it goes from like it looks like they have a zipper like I'm so yeah. blown away by the art artistry actually on TikTok I'm I, I'm super impressed yeah yeah, it's it's a great space. And I feel like, you know, I feel like queer people have really found a home on TikTok. And I'm sure that there are um, some pretty crazy, the wild edits, as you guys were saying. Um, I, I will be searching for them after this. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, definitely a lot of shoney. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. That's, that's where all the um, the tattoos are coming from, is yeah. shoney yeah. TikTok. Um, yeah. So I only... We only have a couple of minutes left. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple more questions. Sarah, something that I have heard you say in the past, in a past interview, is that the island is a metaphor for adolescence. Um, I was wondering if you could just elaborate on this, because I think it's such an interesting and timely idea. Um, and, you know, how that might specifically apply to Tony and Shelby and, and the queer experience, if you can. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, adolescence is such a, a part of our lives that we also we all vividly remember if you have, you know, passed beyond it. Um, and if you're in it, it is so intense and vivid. It is just an incredibly heightened time of your life um, emotionally on a familial level in terms of your self-discovery, um, you know, and <clears throat> so when I conceived of the show, um, the pairing of adolescence and deserted island felt so natural because um, in somewhat dramatic terms, if I am to put it in this way, it is a time of your life that is extremely challenging. Uh, it is extremely revelatory. Um, it is harrowing at times. It is also enormously beautiful at times you know think about those island visuals from new zealand that like breathtaking sublime beauty is also something that you encounter in adolescence that you might <laughs> you know never encounter again maybe you will hopefully you will but it is it is this it's like this crystal goblet of like beauty and and fear and um and it also is something that like <clears throat> you know not everybody makes it through it um, in one piece, not everybody makes it through it as they were, you know, before they entered it, they will inevitably be changed on the other side of it. When you get off the island, when you get on the other side of coming of age, um, you look at yourself, you look inside yourself and you see the immense change. There's no, there's no real going back. You know, and that's that's what's happening with these young women, you know, when they and they, you know, are off the island, as we've seen, they are, <laughs> you know, patently um, not the same in some really incredibly positive ways, you know, and this is the kind of Gretchen's thesis that she's probably going to end up really pointing to, which is that I might have put these young women through the hell of this island, but there's a lot of strength that came out of it. Um, so, um, yeah, that is, that's the essence of that metaphor. And, and it just keeps revealing its truth as we move, uh, as we move forward. Yeah, totally. Um, okay. So to wrap this all up, I just wanted to know, throwing this out there to anyone who can answer if there's anything about season two that you can tell us, especially if it has to do with Shoni. Come on. You will get to see me right now. <laughs> You will get to see more of them. They will not leave the island. You will get to see more of them this season. Yeah, I think, look, we're on a journey with these characters that we adore and they're, they're on the, they're on, you know, we're, I think I, we can comfortably say we, we come back to the island. So we're gonna be, we're, we're gonna be very much with Shoni. Um, as the next portions of the show and the things that have happened to them at the finale become, uh, you know, how that affects them. So nothing's ever a straight line. How's that, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, they've, 
in a environment like a deserted island that is going that is beating you up physically and on a survival level these two have reached for each other have found each other um you know but i think it is a sincere earnest pure love i think in a vacuum even even in the real world you know they might have found a way to find each other and be together but on an island this relationship is an incredibly like wonderful resource for them to find strength and and comfort in a very harrowing world um you know but there's i think that we might find that things can happen that will even challenge that union um it seems so ironclad and such a wonderful source for both of them um but there are elements here that that can challenge even the tightest of this the, as tight as this bond is it's not it's not invulnerable right. no one is safe yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a threat <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> i'm definitely going to be getting some scary twitter uh responses <laughs> to that, I'm sure. oh no <laughs> Well, no one remember, is safe, including me. <laughs> remember, remember that punch me in the face, run me over. These are good things. So <laughs> if it's not, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys so much for for doing this, for being here. This was so fun, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to season two. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Jill. Thank you so much, Have Jill. Been.